these aircraft don't look like anything we're used to. At least not me. Yeah, that's right. And and just touching on that, you know, we're going to talk about the aircraft today, but I think there's a world of, you know, opportunity in terms of changes to uh, employment and uh, operations and doctrine. I mean, to, to Wickman's earlier point, right, that's why there's such a large contingent of people involved in this is, is there are some opportunities in the near future to really revolutionize uh, aerospace. Props, rotors, jets, even lighter than air and gliders, these are all terms familiar to most aviation enthusiasts. But with recent technological advancements, what new terms are about to enter our vernacular? We've already talked about tilt rotors on this show, but what about distributed propulsion? Well, hello and welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I'm your host, Vincent Aiello, call sign Jello. And here to help me understand that today are two guests at the Circle Air Group studio at Gillespie Field in San Diego, California. I've got Tom Marr and Bo Griffith. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. And hey, thanks for having us. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, in paperwork that you sent me leading up to today, there was something in there about the third right revolution, I think it was, in aerospace or aviation. I'm really looking forward to unpacking that. But first, let's get to know you guys. So, Tom, Wickmid, we'll start with you. Where are you from? Where would you go to school? And looks like you're still in the Air Force. So, yeah. What you, yeah so, still what are you in. doing? Uh, so, Tom Maher, go by Wickmid. Uh, originally hailed from Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, went through the Air Force Academy. And then from there, went to grad school and then on to pilot training. And eventually found myself in B-52s. So I did that operationally for a little while, uh, assignment, and then went in the test world. So a lot of bomber tests, uh, some test support with some of the smaller aircraft, uh, and then back uh, with some more program management uh, on the on the heavy side. So found myself through that uh, through that career, and then on to uh, into this current job, working with uh, some emerging tech and some of these new uh, aerospace tech. Very cool. And Wickmid WCMD, I'm getting ahead, but uh, that's I think a wind corrected munition exactly. or something. So we'll yes. get to that at the end. But all right, just want to make sure I had your call sign right. And Stewie Bo Griffith, right? Yep. Uh, where are you from? Mm-hmm. What did you do? And what are you doing now? Yeah, I grew up in uh, North Georgia. Uh, went to UVA for undergrad. Uh, Clearly, I watched Top Gun too many times, <laughs> uh, Officer and a Gentleman not enough times, because I didn't find out about the OCS program until uh, my junior year. But I was fortunate to get picked up for that program, go through uh, flight training as a, as a student NFO, picked up the Super Hornet aircraft uh, and flew as a Wizzo for a couple years. Lost my medical clearance, unfortunately, but I had a great opportunity to go join the AMDO community and worked uh, kind of various roles in uh, maintenance engineering program management. Uh, left the Navy uh, right after about 10 years and uh, worked for Rockwell Collins, now Raytheon, uh, designing helmet-mounted displays, head-up displays, and then worked uh, for an engineering consulting firm called Flighthouse Engineering, doing aerostructural design for uh, UAVs and uh, kind of large urban air mobility platforms. We'll talk about those a little bit more with you today mm-hmm. uh, before I had this opportunity to join the Air Force and, uh, and help the team kind of advance that technology and bring it into the DoD. Join the Air Force, not literally. That's right. Yeah, but, but a, team up with them. I'm a civilian, so I get to wear the snazzy, <laughs> okay. uh, snazzy and, uh, clothes. Well, me too. Still eyeball the, uh, the the flight suit there. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And you brought me a patch. Thank you. It's proudly displayed behind you, so that's always fun. I've got my patches on my side and guest patches on your side. So, all right. So on this show, we have had various episodes on all kinds of cutting edge new tech. Uh, We've had episodes on DARPA, on artificial intelligence, on the future of air combat or air warfare. Um, And when you reached out to me, Stu, I think it was you, like, hey, love what you're doing. Uh, Love to see if we can't help promote what we're doing. And I said, well, we're pivoting to video. So, right. So if you can make it out to San Diego and you did, thanks very much. I think you're my first guest to come in from out of town. But um, let's start big picture, because I think AFWorks came up with our previous conversation, uh, maybe at DARPA, uh, and, and I don't need one of these questions to just whoever wants to jump in, but um, what is AFWorks? Let's start there. Sure. I, we said you a slide, but that'll probably help kind of visualize what we have on, going on throughout yeah, the sure. organization. Yeah, sure. Let's go to that next slide there. We're, we made up, we're, our organization is, is fairly young. Uh, we've been around for about uh, four years in our current format. We continue to evolve uh, fairly fairly rapidly. But we, what you see there is where, how we kind of visualize what we have going on within AFWorks. So in that upper left, the AFWorks, AF Ventures, so that is the execution arm of the Department of the Air Force's small cyber sitter program. So small business innovation research, small business technology transfer program. So okay. that is um, a, a program that all the DOD services and government agencies uh, with a certain budget operate to uh, incentivize 
specialize and go work with small businesses throughout the industrial base, um, a lot of which are doing really good work on the emerging tech side, uh, to try to help grow those companies out and scale some of those technologies into uh, use for the, for the DOD. So I deliberately said Department of the Air Force. AFWERX does cover both the Air Force and the Space Force uh, components uh, within uh, the, the research labs where we're at. Um, so that's that ventures. An additional piece of that is um, staying in touch with the uh, private and venture capital communities to see where uh, those private and other dollars are going into different emerging tech sectors. So we want to be able to uh, leverage what's going on, on the commercial investment side and see where that, that focus is. A lot of the R&D uh, dollars are on the commercial side and not just on the DOD investment side. So staying in tune with that community and where we, we have some synergies is really big focused on the venture side. Um, that spark, that bottomless piece, that's that expanded talent. So that what started as kind of just homegrown for a couple captains uh, in the Air, in the Air Force that had only been for a little while, looking at how do we kind of harness and, and focus on innovation culture within the Air Force. So that's how it started. It's continued to grow out into building really a, a network of folks that are trying to get some of their projects off the ground and sharing lessons learned throughout the Department of the Air Force of, hey, what are the best practices? How do we scale some of these things out? Um, and then also kind of focus into a, an education piece. So we run the Defense Ventures Program, uh, Defense Ventures Fellowship Program, where we send folks out, go put them with uh, companies, uh, with venture capital firms to l- learn from that, their perspective uh, how you can bring ideas back into the Air Force. Uh, so that's the spark piece. We're continuing to grow that out of how do we actually get um, your warfighters out at the user level more involved in some of this emerging tech to figure out how they can actually use it and adopt it. So that's kind of where that that division's going next. And then Prime, where we, where uh, both Bo and I sit, is how do we look at very specific emerging tech, tech sectors on the commercial side, and how do we focus them so we make sure we can leverage that investment uh, for DOD use as well? So we'll talk about, obviously, we're here talking about Agility Prime yeah. and the eVTOL space, so one of them, but we have some other things going on uh, that are upcoming on autonomy. So looking at those tech areas that are starting to, you know, grow up uh, in the U.S., we want to make sure that we foster that, that U.S. industrial base so we have that uh, to rely upon. Gotcha. So in reading, again, the documents you sent me before today, it strikes me that in the past, and I'm not an expert on this, but uh, my impression of it is maybe the military said, hey, we want this. Defense industry, go out and build this for us. And it sounds like, Stewie, I'll look at you here. sounds like it's more collaborative now. Like, hey, there's all this emerging technology in the private sector. Some of that could be adaptable to what military needs. Yeah, I think that's a great way to cover it. Um, you know, if I were to boil it down, right, like sort of traditional acquisition channels say, okay, this is the capability we're trying to grow or or the gap we're trying to cover. These are what we need to do that. Industry, go make me this. And and we're not necessarily trying to replace that per se, but there is an, an opportunity in some cases to say, hey, this is already out there. It's been developed under under private funds. You know, there is a relevant sort of military use case um, that, that we can sort of benefit from the fact that there is also a, a commercial uh, market uh, and rather than spending, you know, I- entirely DOD funds to develop and, and field that technology, we can just sort of bring it into their portfolio um, and then also, you know, provide in doing so uh, some sort of unique uh, government capabilities that aren't necessarily that available in the private sector. So things that come to mind, test and valuation support, uh, infrastructure, the opportunity to fly on ranges, you know, especially when we get to the size of aircraft that we'll see a little bit later when we show you some of the, the other pictures of, of things we've been developing and, and supporting. Um, it can be really difficult to find, you know, range space, uh, to find a COA that's got large enough airspace volumes that you can go out and, and conduct a, an entire flight test campaign. And another, you know, challenge that I saw personally being out there in industry uh, was the availability of test and evaluation personnel. You know, TPS grads are uh, relatively few out there in the private sector, and especially a, a small startup that's developing a new aircraft for the first time, they might not have access um, to somebody with that caliber of test and evaluation experience. Um, you know, we're fortunate, obviously, to have test grads uh, like Wickmid and, and several other members of our staff being able to provide some of that insight and expertise in what we call in-kind can be really valuable uh, for these companies. And so I think like, like Tom was saying earlier, you know, being able to keep 
uh, and, and sort of mature and foster the U.S. industrial base, you know, being able to provide sort of unique benefits beyond just, you know, funding and acquisition from the DOD is really valuable to some of these sort of American companies that are getting off the ground and, and developing and providing something really amazing. Yeah, sounds like it. And again, we've got some cool pictures coming up. All right. So one of the brochures you sent me, and I have to read this because there's no way I was going to remember this. Uh, Agility Prime is uh, expand technology transition paths to accelerate emerging technology markets by leveraging government resources for rapid and affordable fielding, attracting and optimizing external funding and talent. Whew. All right. So somebody translate that for me. So we didn't go with brevity on that one, did we? No. Uh, no. <laughs> um, so here's what it means. I mean, the, the bottom line is, like you mentioned, there's a lot of money going into the commercial sector R&D. There are technologies out there that are, have, certainly have feasibility and utility uh, in DOD use cases. So how do we leverage that external funding? So all that commercial R&D and then just as importantly, uh, how do we leverage that uh, external talent? So part of that, you know, that ventures process, part of our program is bring in like, significant engineering talent that's out there that previously was not working with the government, provide them an avenue to come work with the government. And that provides a couple benefits. One, it lets us see what's out there from a, a little bit different flavor. It also informs these companies of, hey, I had this very specific commercial use case I was going after, working with the DOD and the government gives me some other ideas of how we might use our product. It may not shape in near, near term their first commercial product, but it will give them ideas of, hey, how do I design in for future iterations that can enable a whole other um, cast of, of use cases hmm. of how we use our product. And that, that can spin off different business uh, opportunities for them. So that's kind of the, the big benefits. Of, um, and that, that feeling piece of if there's commercial tech out there that has been significantly invested on, on the uh, private side, that can be a different uh, price point and b- different conversation of how you feel something uh, as opposed to a very top-down uh, driven, which has definitely has a need throughout majority of, of the DOD and how we buy systems, but there is a section where we can leverage this, yeah. this piece. And it's not just, as I understand it, um, a new method per se, but it's also sort of leveraging some of this emerging technology, again, on the distributed propulsion and some other things that we'll get to in a little bit. But Stewie, uh, we got here uh, Agility Prime, uh, historically different methods. Are they better? Are they just different? I mean, what, what's, what's unique about this situation? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, I, I would say they're just different. Um, you know, w- what we're acquiring and what we're developing here isn't necessarily going to replace uh, existing assets, right? Existing aircraft in, in the DOD inventory. Um, because those aircraft are, are developed by brilliant teams of engineers that know exactly what they're doing uh, and are designing around very complex missions. You know, a search and rescue mission uh, is is very complex. It has very uh, high uh, high bar for, for success, and it's a very critical mission, obviously, and that's just one example. Um, but an H-60 is used in a variety of mission sets, right? It's not just used for SAR. It's not just used... Um, for transportation, and and we find that um, you know leveraging these sort of novel methods gives us an ability to draw in other assets that can sort of supplement uh, the DoD's portfolio, mm. right? So if we're talking about uh, you know logistics, just moving things from place to place, or maybe maybe simpler missions might be a good a good way to uh, to describe it. You know, sort of onboarding some of these technologies to relieve the demand on uh, the the higher level. Uh, more exquisite uh, aircraft uh, where they can go out and do the, you know, the higher order missions, the more critical missions while we bring in these sort of more affordable, uh, more bespoke aircraft um, is valuable. And and like Tom was saying earlier, you know, there's already been significant investment in them. And so with sort of, um, you know, some guidance and collaboration, uh, there's a great path for that that we've been able to build uh, within the Prime team. Cool. Yeah, I think kind of it, uh, on how the approach is different, is that for Agility Prime, we didn't say, go build us this. We said, here's three general areas. We'll talk about these later on mm-hmm. uh, that we're interested in, that we see a need that you could use for DOD use cases. What do you have out there in industry that kind of meet, fits those those buckets? And then let's, let's see how we could use those platforms. Okay. So it's a very different, uh, it's basically a backwards approach of, as opposed to go build this. Right. It's a, hey, what do you have? Let's see how we can possibly use that. Uh, with minimal or, or 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 no changes there, so that's kind of the approach. How many people are involved in this? Is it hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, dozens? I mean, I, 
this was new to me before you reached out, Stu. Yeah. So I'd say a few different answers as far as in the industry, <laughs> well, a lot. Right, of course. But like <laughs> in don't. this particular Agility Prime as part oh, of the sure. AppWorks and all that. Sure, absolutely. So we we have structured, the, the program is really built on um, you know, establishing partnerships throughout. So whether that's with the investor community, the in, industrial base, um, our, certainly our warfighters in the labs that are developing some of the tech, uh, but then also state and local governments, uh, interagency is really uh-huh. critical. Okay. Um, I'll say that. For example, in all this commercial tech, if you look at this, these new sectors, the criticality of NASA and the FAA to eventually get to these civil certifications uh, cannot be understated. So sure. us, just through this program, by necessity, we've gone to build those relationships. With, hey, NASA, you've done a lot of this work uh, with these companies early on and some of this tech. What are you seeing? Where are the areas for collaboration? Uh, NASA has their uh, national campaign that's looking at advanced air mobility and how they uh, help inform that for eventual FAA mm-hmm. use, and then the FAA is certainly this is a new class of aircraft. So there's a you, there's a lot of stuff that's been out there in the news of hey, how's the FAA going to handle right. this type of and and more importantly, how are they going to certify it? Not only the aircraft, but also the operators. I mean, maintain maintenance port, portion of it. Uh, so building those. Those relationships are really critical. Mm. It's a long way of saying there's a lot of people involved <laughs> in this team. Uh, certainly within the government team, we also partner with uh, the program office and the labs and our operational tests and our developmental tests. So anytime you maybe have up to 100, 100 people. Within the AFWorks team, it's fairly small. We have uh, anywhere about 15, 20 people okay. that are actually permanently assigned as well as some uh, support contracts and others. So the team is fairly s- small, but we branch out to build relationships throughout uh, the DOD and, and externally. So the broader team is fairly large. Sure. So I want you guys to help me understand the change at this revolution, in a sense, in aviation. Because uh, Stewie, the the Hornet we flew, right, had two engines, centerline. Uh, My 757 I fly now has two engines on the wings. Uh, Wickmid, your B-52 is almost distributed propulsion with eight (laughs) eight engines out there. But but what's going on? Like, I don't know. I I had this epiphany the other day. Like, everything I I thought I knew seems to be changing really fast, whether it's technology or our phones or the society, but let's not go there. But but there's this whole, and we have a model here on the desk, there's this whole revolution. It's really the best way to put it, I feel like. And these aircraft don't look like anything we're used to, at least not me. Yeah, that's right. And and just touching on that, you know, we're going to talk about the aircraft today, but I think there's a world of, you know, opportunity in terms of changes to uh, employment and uh, operations and doctrine. I mean, to, to Wickman's earlier point, right, that's why there's such a large contingent of people involved in this is, is there are some opportunities in the near future to really revolutionize uh, aerospace. You were asking specifically about the aircraft, and I think we should probably define distributed propulsion, some of the sort of novel technologies and concepts that are being brought to bear here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think the model that we have here is, uh, is Beta Aircraft's ALEA um, is the name of the aircraft. And, and you can see, you know, it's got, uh, it's got four rotors here, right, not really a traditional rotor craft, and then a, a smaller uh, kind of pusher, pusher propeller here. Um, and this enables the aircraft to, to lift off vertically, right, like a helicopter, and then start its pusher motor and transition in, into fixed-wing flight. So it's uh, occasionally people call that a hybrid. Uh, it's not a hybrid in the way you and I are necessarily used to thinking about where it's sort of an electric battery and an, an engine, although that, that comes to play here. Mm-hmm. Um, but re- what really enables that are, are two pieces of technology. One is high energy density, high power batteries. Uh, commercial market for electric vehicles has certainly allowed a, a lot of maturity and a lot of development uh, that's now being brought into the aerospace sector. And then high power, high torque DC motors. Um, so our Hornet used jet engines, right? Uh, those are very large uh, and very specific and very well engineered, um, but it's sort of an integrated system and uh, you can afford one or two of them in a design, but you're definitely not strapping, you know, eight 414s in, in crazy places on the Hornet, right, to get different sort of uh, uh, aerodynamic parameters. And now with these high voltage electrical systems and uh, and the relatively, you know, efficient DC motors, we can put the thruster sort of wherever we want on the aircraft and just run wires to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really enabled the realization 
of of designs that uh, you know brilliant aero, aero engineers at NASA and uh, private industry and other uh, R and D organizations have have dreamed of. And you said the word hybrid earlier, and, and I think back just in the last what ten fifteen years, right? The Toyota Prius was somewhat revolutionary for the time; it was a hybrid. Uh, but now you've got all electric vehicles. So you you talked about this beta is. Is one of the engines uh, traditional in a sense? I, don't, I might not use the right terminology here, but are there um, internal combustion or whatever you'd call it engines, or are there other applications? Where does hybrid come in? Yeah, so I'd say the the key piece that we talked about is that, hey, if you get that distributed propulsion that has that electrical grid, mm-hmm. what you power that by, you can you can change that. So okay. in this case, beta, is, that's all electric at this point. All so right. they have a number of battery packs that are powering it. We have some other companies that we'll talk about that have a hybrid approach. So they have the lift motors that are all electric, but then they have the pusher motor uh, that's running on, on, on gas. So that's kind of a hybrid setup that you could have. You could also have other companies that are out that are looking at what, what other fuels can be used. So if you have this distributed electric propulsion, then could you run that with a hydrogen fuel cell and hmm. use that as a propellant? Or you could put in a, just put a motor in there that's powering and generate, creating that electricity to drive that propulsion. So there's a mix of there. I, I would say in industry a little bit, they call it eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But in reality, once you have that infrastructure, you can power by other things. So there is certainly a little bit of a misnomer. There are hybrid power applications that are out there um, if you look at what all the major engine manufacturers are doing, a lot of them are looking at hybrid powertrains, in this case with the advanced air mobility, because they can meet the design requirements they need for those shorter-range missions with just uh, with battery technology. They're going yeah. with just batteries as a source. Hmm. It certainly simplifies uh, some pieces, but there's a lot of opportunities for as they move forward once you've gotten that base kind of infrastructure and how you design the vehicles of what you power it with. Yeah. So we're going to see a lot of ch- changes in iteration throughout oh, I'm uh, sure. the industry. Yeah, I'm sure. And I had questions about the vehicles, but I think let's jump ahead and take a look at some of them. And, and you can tell me uh, what projects we're working on right now. So this looks, uh, is that the beta? It, it looks is. Like what it's we have beta. On? Okay. So uh, I, I take it also lightness is important on these vehicles? Maybe, uh, maybe not, but I'm guessing also composites and uh, smaller electronics than ever before, right? Uh, my 757 is still pretty <laughs> archaic inside, but it gets us there. Um, but I'm guessing these are also very light, uh, easily adaptable, probably plug in something and diagnose, right? Yeah, I think we, we, we talked about two of the big pieces that have enabled this, this market to start to, to grow up. That's that electrical power systems, a lot of stuff that's come out of the, you know, the electric car uh, market, you've got increased automation or desire on some of these platforms. That'll that'll enable some things. And then the third one is that h- how do you manufacture these differently to get to a scale? If you mm. really look at this market and what they need to do, uh, you, they want to be ma- manufacturing at scale, which means a slightly different take on how you, you build an aircraft. A lot of composites certainly are involved with it. Um, an interesting thing that just uh, as a side note, what we've seen is there's a lot of supplier overlap between traditional aviation and what these companies are building with, whether it's from the avionics stacks to your normal, you know, um, Garmin, Honeywell, that type of thing, um, to your the structures, who's building these structures, who's building the composites. So there's a key piece on there of, of industrial base of, of providing another demand signal to, to strengthen that within hmm. the country. Okay. All right. Let's see what's next. Uh, this is a Joby aircraft. Um, you can see it. It looks quite different from Beta. <laughs> um, if you if you really start to pay attention, you know this has six rotors uh, as opposed to four with the pusher, uh, and these actually tilt. So Jelly, you mentioned sort of at the beginning of the show. Uh, I think we've started to become used to the tilt rotor concept in, right. in aircraft like the the V twenty two Osprey, um, and this is sort of a realization of that. Right? Can it rotate independently? Or would there be a need to as part of maybe a flight control system, or are they all going together? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, we've looked at two so far, and, and we'll see more as we go through these pictures. I'll say, you know, the the capabilities that are being enabled by these technologies and, and sort of also the market for mm-hmm. them, the demand from both commercial and military, um, there are a lot of design trades happening at these different companies, and, and the market hasn't necessarily consolidated into one sort of best aircraft, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, but what's really cool is, you know, we see these different architectures, and some of them do tilt only some of their uh, 
some of their rotors. We'll see an example of that shortly. Okay. Uh, some of them tilt them all. Some of them have the sort of lifter plus pusher. And so really the, the ability to shift your power system around the aircraft in different phases of flight, in different conditions, unlocks a lot of uh, really interesting opportunities. And it sort of comes down to, okay, what is the exact mission happening here? And is it worth the R&D investment, the complexity, if, if that exists, in order to get the best performance out of this mission? Gotcha. Um, so what we're seeing, you know, especially with the market being fairly young, uh, people making different trade-off decisions. And that's what I think makes what we do at Prime so interesting is we're helping to kind of shape those decisions and also understand them and how they could be of benefit to the, sure. to the military. And is that, I would assume, somewhat of an iterative process? Hey, if we change this, look what happened. This happened. And so now, all right, well, what if we change it this way instead? And so you're just always, right, tweaking and iterating and trying to find... What makes the most sense? Maybe. Yeah, I mean the, comp- the companies are. We're not directing, hey, go do this, but mm-hmm. they are quickly iterating on, on certainly their control scheme and their, their setups to try to get you know to market first and see what is successful. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are they are rapidly changing on their how they go through their uh, their software and their sure. their design cycle. So it's really exciting to watch yeah. and see them them go through that 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 period. And what's really cool about that, too, is uh, a lot of these companies are bringing to bear something called digital engineering. So uh, you had Bones on uh, one of your episodes, and you guys were kind of admiring the fact that the F-5, which is an amazing airplane, uh, was designed by brilliant engineers with slide rules. That's right. Uh, and what happens when you have you know, a bunch of really brilliant people working with slide rules is it's like you know, 10 years later, when you need to make a change, it's like, Where's uh, where Joe go? You know, you got to go find those data, find that information, and, and in some cases, find the designer that made those mm-hmm. decisions. Uh, but the DoD and 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 industry generally has gone through a big change where you know creating digital artifacts and digital twins of of aircraft so that we can go through that iterative loop much faster and more effectively is uh, is enabled. And um, and that's been the case for, for most, if not all, of, of these companies that we've been working with is they have really advanced models of, of their powertrain system, the aerodynamics, and they can quickly do those sort of what-if analyses. Sure. You know, what if we cut a rotor off or, you know, what if what have you? Right, sure. Uh, and, and see what the impacts would be and sort of work with customers and, and the business case to, to really understand that and, and, uh, and iterate the design quickly. Okay. And I read in one of the brochures, and maybe it wasn't the Joby, I don't know, but as far as performance goes, and I'm sure it's changing rapidly, but I think I read 200-mile uh, range, up to 11,000 feet, 200 miles an hour, uh, and longest endurance, uh, about two hours. Um, th- this is significant performance we're getting out of these aircraft, I would say. Yeah, and so those numbers were kind of a mix of what we've seen on some of the you know, the duration and, and speeds between Beta and Joby, sure. uh, and where, they're, where, where they've been optimized for. But it's been impressive. They have continually kind of expanded out their envelope. So just like any other sure. n- new aircraft, they're really starting to push where they can get to their, their design point and even exceeding where they had originally uh, forecasted as the initial commercial need. So it's been exciting to see that progression. Good. All right, let's see what we have next. And I didn't study hard, so I'm afraid uh, I'm not going to be able to tell you what, what I'm looking at, but maybe you can. That's okay. Well, I will say, on, <laughs> go back to that, the previous one real quickly on that one. So that, that is Joby's. What you'll see there is there's, there's no pilot on board right now. Oh, wow. um, so where when they go to market, they will be piloted. Uh, that's their initial, their initial plan. But when they're doing some of this initial testing, it's remotely operated. So it's wow. a really interesting thing that as a risk reduction factor, as they're developing these things quickly and iterating, through it as you can take the pilot out as they're just doing the basic, you know, initial flight envelope sure. work. So that's really exciting to see uh, that previously wasn't able to be done, but we're seeing this a little more throughout industry as, hey, here's how we reduce risk initially as we're developing these things where we have a lot more unknowns but as we start to build that data set mm-hmm. and, and our picture of where the capabilities are. So, Well, wouldn't that capability be important perhaps to whether civil or military, right? If you're a rich person on Manhattan skyline, thing lands, picks you up, maybe you don't want a pilot. Pilots are expensive, I can tell you. Um, but on the battlefield, maybe too. Uh, so is optionally manned going to be part of the discussion, do you think? I, I think there is. What you're seeing uh, on the commercial side with FAA certification is that initially most are going for pilot operation because that's the near-term path of how they can through the FAA mm-hmm. certification. Uh, but then you also see other entrants, for example, WISC, that is, they have stated they're going after. Um, we're going to go without a pilot, and we're going to build that in from the start of our, our plan. Uh, and so working with the FAA to get them thinking about how do we actually certify some of that, keeping in mind that you know public safety is priority number one, and then how do they, they 
test those things out. So mm. uh, whereas the initial operations that you'll see uh, on the commercial side will be piloted, there is a push for increased automation and eventually going to without pilots. Um, so there is that eventual roadmap. Um, there will be a couple that we'll talk to that are kind of on the cargo ones that are going – uh, just remote operated from the from the start. And I think that's a lot of where the military expertise comes in. We could, we're helping to provide some advice to some of these companies. We've been doing, uh, you know, remote operations for the past three three decades or so, and just on our current mm-hmm. uh, current fight with all the way from M- Predators, MQ ones, all up to our current platforms that we have today. Uh, so providing some of those lessons learned there, but it's been all in a military. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's a big change too, right? Because whereas right now, and it has been for 80, 100 years, the, the, the paradigm is somebody's in there, see and avoid. All our rules are based on manned aircraft. And I always think of, uh, I know it's kind of goofy, but uh, one of the Star Wars movies where they go to Coruscant, or I don't even know how to pronounce it, but there's that one planet where there's just these pathways in the sky and all these vehicles traveling along. And I think to myself, are we headed for that? I mean, are we going to have highways in the sky and like you get on that thing at this speed and, and you just flow with traffic like we do on interstates? Uh, but I don't think that's something that's going to happen overnight, doesn't seem like to me. Uh, but that's something that the industry is pushing for and will be a, will be a gradual uh, basically scaling up. And what that started at is is really right now where it's at. When we say advanced air mobility, that covers a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. It's not just these EV tolls, but everything from like small drone delivery up to other different concepts. So a lot of what you're seeing right now for that, uh, you'll see pilot programs out of drone delivery. Of, you have things like uh, Zipline uh, and, and companies from Alphabet and others that are doing a hey, small drone delivery. Let's Let's see how this works for how do we control these things within airspace? How do we deconflict from existing traffic? That's a big modernization uh, effort yeah. to change how we have traditionally managed aircraft in the airspace to now we have a lot of different remote operated uh, or uncrewed platforms that are moving around this airspace. That's a challenge that the FAA and NASA and others have been working towards that will not be overnight, but is a significant enabler to make some of these concepts and scale of, of remote operations possible. And I think the technology will be, will be a big part of that because most modern vehicles will take over from you, right, if you're going to run into the guy in front of you or or run off the road. So I think it's it's just becoming – more commonplace in our vehicles and probably same thing for aviation. So there's another one that looks just like this. I think it's on the next slide, but that one's, wow. So, all right. So, and again, you call this the what again? Uh, this is Archer's Midnight Aircraft. The one we were looking at right before that uh, was Archer Aviation's Maker. Maker was sort of the initial vehicle, uh, initial development demonstrator vehicle. And Midnight will be their production aircraft that was just announced recently uh, this month in, in November. Um, and you can see, you know, we were talking earlier about how Joby's aircraft tilts all six rotors. You can see here uh, Midnight has six thrust, or I'm sorry, 12 thrusters, uh, six of which tilt. And then the front six, those are the ones that tilt and, and actually pull the aircraft forward. Those have five blades, whereas the ones in the back only have two. Um, and just commenting on that briefly, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, there's all these different trades that get made around, you know, mission performance and development costs and and uh, logistics and sustainment decisions. Uh, the, the ones in the back are, um, are two-bladed because they can then align with uh, the airstream and reduce drag. So those rotors were specifically chosen to be two-bladed. Uh, to reduce drag and, and increase the endurance and, and range of the aircraft. And I think the fact that we've looked at three aircrafts just so far with you, we've seen three different designs and configurations, just goes to reinforce the idea uh, that there's so many different opportunities that have been enabled here uh, with different you know pros and cons to each. Sure. So you're saying this midnight will raise mm-hmm. up vertically, again, the EV tall, I think you said, Wickman, and then it's going to transition to forward flight with those forward six blades or props or whatever we want to call them tilting down and then the back six will just fare into the wind and now you're flying like a traditional aircraft that's right okay and all electric on this one yes so everything's programmed computerized uh yeah amazing okay uh, all right so now this is a- so, we, so we have different yeah now we have a different <laughs> version so yeah we don't have to back up slides but what we did on there because these all look very different is for agility prime we had hey here's three different areas of interest that we we want to look at Mm -hmm. that first area of interest is what you saw with beta joby archer that's kind of your hey moving people uh, and stuff around you know four six passengers 150 miles something like that which is what industry was already going towards so that's our first area of interest the second one you've got some smaller vehicles of hey what do we do if you had a maybe a shorter range one to two people or cargo equivalent how do we use that 
And then the third one is, hey, what about maybe a more longer range, uh, maybe cargo specific, uh, possibly remote operated type thing. So those are our three areas of interest. So that's why you'll see these are vastly different when we look at yeah. the pictures of what these things are. And those serve different mission sets uh, on what you're seeing there. So uh, this one is from uh, Lyft Aircraft based on Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, so we've been doing uh, re- remote operated flights down at uh, uh, the Eglin and Herbert area uh, in Duke Field area down in Florida for a little while. Uh, with them, and this was in the commercial side. They're looking at you know just a single person. How do you get uh, somebody in there with pretty minimal training, fairly high, high, highly automated, hot, automated? Mm-hmm. Uh, excuse me, uh, and then get them to kind of fly around a little bit uh, and do sightseeing and other things. Well, from the DoD perspective, hey, how do we look at maybe a, a base type setup where we move stuff around? Maybe we can't get there mm-hmm. uh, in other methods. So that's what we're kind of interested to see. Hey, this is a very different looking concept. Let's see uh, how we operate this sort of thing. How What can we learn from it and see where it goes, goes from there? So sure. that's, that's Lyft Hexa. So in my current capacity as an airline pilot, I spend a bunch of time training whenever I go back for training on if we lose an engine, particularly on takeoff because you got that thrust and you know, all the yaw. That's a turbine, right? So it's subject to uh, different whims of physics, but uh, everything is, is a dumb thing to say. But the point is, how reliable are these? It, it, do, do these folks spend a lot of time? Or are these engines fairly foolproof? I mean, in aviation, almost nothing's foolproof. But electric motors, I mean, they're usually pretty reliable. Yeah, so that's what we're seeing. I mean, long term with this industry, what you're seeing is a decrease in your operations sustainment cost because of simplicity of the DC motor. So mm-hmm. ensuring that tech out so that it will be have that high reliability rate is certainly a part of what all these companies are looking at. Yeah. And we look at some of these concepts that have a number of rotors, well, that provides some uh, redundancy and safety factor in there in case you do have some issues with those to get back to a safe, safe spot. So that's what we're seeing a lot of the tech maturation on is, hey, how do we prove out these DC motors uh, and see where their reliability is at so we have that confidence, sure. just like any other aircraft sure. development. Sure, and I'm, yeah, I'm guessing in the early 1900s it was the same thing, right? The motors were <laughs> yes. probably not too great. I thought you said this one was unmanned at some point. I see a hand, I feel like, in there. So Yeah, this is, it... this, is a, this is a company photo, so Lyft, Lyft does have uh, people when they're, they're flying them there. Okay. They also operate them remotely, so just like some of the other companies, uh, we're operating with them remotely. We actually just had, uh, earlier in, in November, we had three Air Force operators go get train, ground training and so flight training for oh. operating them. Because we'll, we'll learn a lot there from how do we look train our operators differently and a wide variety of, of skill sets that they have come in for. They're not necessarily uh, pilot background, but how do we get them to operate some of these other things, these other UASs, yeah. uh, and, and learn from that? Well, even right, 16-year-olds are taught to drive a car, so not to say that uh, you, know, you can just jump in one of these and go, but you might need some basic, and, and most people learn how to drive a car, so maybe most people can learn how to operate this. All right, let's see what's next. So that looks a little similar, except now just four, but actually eight. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's the Moog Surefly aircraft, um, and yeah, you you called it eight rotors, uh, each one stacked on, or two stacked on top mm-hmm. of one another. We call that coaxial. Um, yeah, I think I think similar sort of use case to uh, to the lift aircraft. You know, smaller passenger contingent, but still certainly uh, kind of of interest in that in that smaller form factor that we sure. were looking into. So I've not flown a regular helicopter, but I do know that they lose tail rotor authority. They have problems and uh, other issues related to that. Are most of these balanced in a sense? As far as they've got so many propulsion sources, it seems like. But also the way this goes, I wouldn't think there's a whole lot of. I might be getting the terms wrong, but torque or, or rotation, et cetera? Correct. And that's why I see a lot of redundancy in some of these designs mm-hmm. so that if they do have single 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 failures, they have that ability to yeah. you know, get to a safe spot. Um, you'll see that also in the design of the electrical system. So not having just one uh, <laughs> wire, <laughs> one, yeah, one yeah. critical wire, yeah, um, yeah. No, having some of those you know, alternate paths for the sure. electricity to get to those motors and also having those motors on, on different, uh, different buses to be able okay. to do that. Good. All right, let's see what's next. Elroy Air. Yeah, Look. so this is in our, our third area of interest. So this is a cargo operation. So there's no pilot in that one. That is a remotely operated uh, from the start. And the interesting thing that you look about this um, is that you see that cargo pod. So they are, from the start, they're designing for how do we move cargo and things around. Okay. Um, a lot of these companies are paired with some of the major you know, transportation companies, you know, FedEx, UPS, sure. Amazon, those type of uh, organizations of looking at how do they move stuff around. Um, and so th- there's some really interesting things on this vehicle specifically of uh, how do they kind of automate the loading and loading of a, a cargo pod or something similar like that. 
uh, how they have the setup for this one. This this is a hybrid from so this is the actual one that's going after hybrid powertrains. So they've got uh, electrical to do the vertical takeoff piece and then transition to their their, their pusher motor. So it's kind of similar configuration. They've got you know electric lift and then a, a pusher motor once they get up to up to altitude to go. So. And what kind of capacity are we talking? I mean, is it significant? Uh, a couple thousand pounds, or is it just enough to make it worthwhile? I'm, and I'm sure that's changing a lot. But yeah, so this one, for example, is you know three to five hundred pounds. You know, similar about three hundred miles or so. So they're looking okay. at they're, that can cover a different um, you know different scope than maybe some of the other types of vehicles, but still fill, fit a lot of needs sure. uh, out there in just uh, a base logistics type type scenario, or, or also on the commercial side. Yeah. So transitioning into into flying. Um, you know, we've we've had an opportunity to work with some of these companies, and in some cases, we've actually put you know airmen, uh, a soldier in one case, uh, into some of these aircraft and had them f- fly around. Uh, obviously, we didn't have a chase plane this close, so this is in the simulator uh, for Beta Zalia. Uh, but but who you see there is uh, is George Hogg Griffiths, who's part of the AFWorks team. Um, you know, you touched on it earlier, right? Can we get to a point where a 16-year-old can jump into one of these and fly? Uh, I don't have any 16-year-olds uh, in my house, which means I don't have to worry too much about their driving. I certainly don't need to pay for their insurance. Yeah. Uh, but where we do see the market going is to sort of simplified vehicle operations, where through automation or just advanced systems and avionics, uh, the burden on the pilot uh, becomes much, much lower. And, and that, again, opens up sort of a whole bevy of, of opportunity, you know, whether that's enabling the pilot to execute, uh, you know, more advanced mission sets uh, by kind of opening up their bucket a little bit for other tasks or just kind of lowering the bar for the operator if we are talking about a piloted aircraft. And that then segues for me, the big question on this, this being the Fighter Pilot Podcast, is all these aircraft we were looking at for the most part were white. And, of course, we want them to be high visibility, I suppose, in testing. Uh, not a lot of gray or green. Green. So how do we see this, right? You're in uniform. So where is the overlap with the military? I mean, I can imagine a couple, right, taking stuff out to forward deployed f- folks, uh, whether it's troops on the ground or ships, uh, search and rescue maybe. But where is the application for the military? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a, a lot. Yeah. Um, so what we did was back in I guess, summer 2020, we had uh, folks from across the Department of the Air Force as well as some of their services to look at, hey, how would we use them? So look at every possible use case you could use with a different type of vehicle. Let's kind of narrow down what, what makes sense in like this near-term time frame, mm-hmm. this few years, what makes sense kind of you know, five, seven years, and what makes sense maybe long-term of how we see this tech progressing. And so, at, as you can imagine, you know, near-term uses are going to be fairly similar to what they're doing on the commercial side. So, moving people and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're developing these things for kind of that, you know, 150, 200 mile type range. So, we, we certainly have needs there as well that we could do it. Whether that's, you know, DV airlift, moving just people around where we normally use rotary wing or other stuff. Uh, or just if, if you're in a kind of a smaller cluster of bases, we can move things around, whether that's parts or people to go, you know, get aircraft up and running. Um, so those are kind of your near-term stuff. What that kind of moves out to is how do we uh, operate in maybe a dispersed environment? So maybe we have a hub-and-spoke type operation where maybe I don't need to use a C-130 every time to move if there's just a few parts or maybe a couple people that need to go out to go to one of these spokes. Maybe I can use a different type of logistics platform. Long-term, as these become more uh, automated, what is kind of like an unmanned uh, search and rescue type capability? That's not today, but the, you can see a t- tech path eventually to get in that sort of capability where all of a sudden this opens up some possibilities uh, where we might not want to put a person in harm's way. So, I mean, you've seen some stuff that came out of the DARPA alias program uh, that they developed with the uh, HH-60 and f- flying without people on there. They've done a lot of demos recently in the project conversions. So some of that tech, uh, while not necessarily yet on the electric side, is being developed. And so as you can see kind of these convergence of these different tech paths to get to different propulsion types, uh, different autonomy and automation to enable some pretty interesting uses. And I don't think we'll even fully appreciate or recognize what uses there could be until we field it, right? So we had an episode, or uh, depending on when people watch this, coming up on the CMV-22, replacing the C-2 Greyhound at the carriers, and suddenly you have all these new mission sets it can perform, potentially, but they have to be manned accordingly and trained. So very interesting. All right, I have some listener questions. Can we uh, rattle these off? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so these are the Patreon supporters who uh, get a, a leg up, if you will, on what's coming. And I told them I was be I would be sitting down with you. So John Clark, now I've read this one a couple times. Uh, let's see if we can figure this out together. Uh, support technologies will be crucial for the successful implementation of these concepts in the field. How will midpoint parentheses point of contact, point of insertion, cargo drop operations 
support vehicle round trip recharging when things don't go as planned in combat. So I don't know, maybe you can grab a part of that, but it does remind me of something I wished my wife's Tesla. I wish there was like a gas station, but electric station where I could pull in something underneath the car would pull off an old battery, put on a new battery. I could just keep going. Now, the reason I think they'll never do that is because then I don't go inside and buy a Coke in a candy bar. <laughs> so I might be a little cynical, but um, are all these, let me take this stab at it and you can come back to John's question. Are all these plug something in and wait, or are there replaceable or removable battery packs? Or what are we thinking about once we actually out and field these things? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, maybe sp- split the question up into two, right? Like, what are the sort of supporting elements and technologies that are going to go into making these even more performant, uh, either in military or commercial use cases? And and I think generally, Tom touched on this earlier, um, we're exploring the full package. You know, I I remember uh, back in my Navy days, uh, my boss, who had, uh, Skipper, who had worked at a program office for some years, first question when I checked on board with him was, do you know the 12 elements of a product support package? And I was like... (laughs) Of course. <laughs> I just put on lieutenant. No, no, no. I, I barely know my name, sir. Uh, so, but that always stuck with me, you know, and, and becoming a systems engineer in industry, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to always think, you know, systemically throughout operations. And that's something that we're working with some other sort of partner companies and, and also helping uh, uh, give some advice for uh, logistics and sustainment considerations. Um, one of the things we're working on is sort of a mobile trailer that can, you know, rapidly recharge batteries so that rather than needing to plug into, uh, you know, the Tesla supercharger, as it were, mm-hmm. uh, we've got the ability to, you know, quickly recharge uh, on site, uh, wherever that site may be, and, you know, ruggedized, easily transportable. Um, so we're looking into that, I, I think, much in the same way, you know, and I, I think you really touched on it well. The mission sets will evolve as we learn more about these technologies. You know, there there is a fairly open space in terms of developing. Uh, and the utility of, of enabling and supporting technologies, um, where it's really tough to, you know, say, okay, we're going to narrow down and, and really focus here on, on, say, tooling, that sort of thing. Um, that's something we're looking into. I think in terms of, you know, executing a mission, right, uh, energy, whether we're talking electrons or we're talking rotten dinosaurs, you know, energy management for a pilot is, is largely the same. You have a fixed amount of energy, um, and, and you need to manage it throughout the mission. So we, we expect a ladder for an eVTOL will look fairly similar to a ladder. Uh, for for a traditional gas powered aircraft, uh, the one thing that I think we might be missing out on is the opportunity to hit the tanker. Um, but there's some there's some amazing you know conceptual development and, and early R and D happening at places like NASA and DARPA uh, around some concepts for for things like that. So again, you know we're we're just at at the forefront of a, of a large revolution in technological capability and by extension how you how you a- execute a flight mission. Yeah. So you don't foresee, or maybe you do, a uh, a basket being held behind some airplane with <laughs> plug in. Hey, I plug in and get gas. Why can't I plug in and get electrons? I mean, there, there are concepts out there. The thing yeah. that you're talking about, the DARPA, I think it's recently released, is how to use power beaming for you know, moving you know, electrons out there to charge. Maybe uh, I mean initially be on, on on small small UAVs, but cool. how do you get them uh, to maybe you know supplement some of those high energy yeah. demand areas? So that's certainly what, what some other organizations are looking at. If you look at these type of platforms, your large energy demand is on that VTOL space, you know, take off landing space. So maybe is there a way as this tech develops, I mean, it's very uh, early days, uh, maybe how do you supplement that initial, that high energy demand, you know, take off landing type phase with maybe some alternate uh, power beaming or something like yeah. that. That's a ways out there, <laughs> yeah. but those are some of the concepts that would be really interesting to see as those things mature, sure. uh, moving along. Uh, as far as like your one question of, hey, are they going to do removable battery packs? We haven't seen as much of that uh, material. That's certainly a, a larger effort. And really, when you, when you get down to it, um, even for these these aircraft that you're seeing, the charge times are pretty short. Um, and if they're doing a lot of kind of short hops in a, in a uh, you know, urban type environment, a commercial environment, it's not always you're going to need to continually recharge, uh, as well as you're talking about less than an hour, uh, sometimes even even less uh, from that. So the charging demands aren't seen as a huge barrier right now in the commercial use cases, and we're exploring how to utilize them in a military perspective. Stu, you said ladder earlier, and uh, you and I know what that means, but for the audience, just a quick reminder is you're basically planning your fuel burn, and particularly at the ship, if you have to be back at a certain time, then you need to manage that with time as well. But in this case, we're talking about electricity, let's say, or electrons. Well, hey, I know I need to be at this place, so I need to manage my electrons or gallons, whatever it might be, pounds for us usually. Uh, Okay, so that makes sense. Getting back to John's question, though, right? 
correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like the biggest source or the most common source now of creating electrons requires fuel. Uh, generators, I presume, if I'm using the term correctly. So if I've got to move fuel and a generator out to some place so that I can use an electric aircraft, am I overstating an issue here? Or I mean, I feel like it's right self-licking ice cream cone, people have, have said before, but <laughs> uh, I never quite understood what that meant. But, but I guess what I'm saying is we have some novel concepts, but I feel like they're maybe dependent on they're just going to serve themselves by moving out the things they might need to leapfrog along, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, so I think there's some interesting things there. So one, if you, uh, if we have maybe, dis- say we're getting to a, down in the future where we have a number of these distributed bases, um, there likely will be some sort of electrical infrastructure there. So right. you could possibly utilize that. If you're, you know, generating electricity at a larger scale, just like we see with, uh, you know, energy across our, our grids, if you make that at a larger scale, you could have some efficiencies there in creating that energy as opposed to just many, many little individual engines or something like that. Mm-hmm. So there's some certainly some efficiencies uh, there eventually. You certainly could have the case that you're talking about where we have you know, just you know, generators to power these things up. Um, or then you also look at some of the other advances in, say, for example, a different concept of hey, maybe small nuclear reactors that different agencies within the government are working at. Well, that opens up a very different wow. uh, solution set. If all of a sudden I've got uh, some electrical uh, aircraft type capabilities or hybrid capabilities, but then I have uh, a high power energy source that is not reliant on some of those fossil fuels. You get a combination of these different technologies, and it becomes a little bit interesting on how you maybe would uh, employ that. And we're a little, little ways off from that, but some of the things are really developing interesting on that on that scale. Um, so I think we'll continue to see some uh, definitely uh, interesting thoughts going down that path as the tech matures of yeah. how do we move energy around. Sure. It's no different problem. It's just maybe different medium. Well, and you just said something. Maybe you don't want to touch on it, but aren't like micro reactors becoming a thing? Like, is anyone talking about putting those on aircraft or do you not want to go I'm there? Not, I've not heard anybody talk about putting those on aircraft <laughs> by, any, uh, by any means. Okay. But as far as like a, a, a fuel source to charge these things up, that certainly is a you know, near-term case. So, no, we, for the record, we do not have any <laughs> nuclear-powered uh, aircraft uh, okay. in our program. <laughs> All right. Next listener question is from Jevin. Are there plans to electrify, and I don't know if that's the right word, but I like it, existing aircraft, uh, and he lists specifically the V-22 Osprey. And, and if I might take a stab at that, I would just think, the Osprey was built, right, with people with the, the, not slide rules anymore, thank goodness, but they know, hey, I've got to build it this way because this pod is this heavy and it's got to tilt like this. And so I don't think you would build it like that if it was electrified, quote unquote. And now to try to take that design and take the motor out or engine, whatever we want to call it, and try to electri- – I don't know. I just see that being as a huge I – don't, I don't see the benefit in that, but I don't know. Is there an effort? Yeah, you nailed it, Jello. Um you know, the, the V-22 specifically was designed around its engine. Its engine was designed around it. I mean, the engine and the aircraft design are, are, are linked uh, inextricably. And so, uh, like you, I, I'm not sure. I, I certainly don't know of any efforts to, you know, in, install an electric engine in an Osprey or, or any really large kind of existing rotor craft. There is some interesting work being done on, on the commercial side. Um, I think somebody recently flew an electrified R-44 um, there, there's quite a few companies that are uh, converting uh, sort of legacy fixed wing, particularly trainer aircraft, oh. into electrically powered. Um, and, and that's, you know, fairly straightforward. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I, I don't think we have any, any grand aspirations <laughs> to go out there and electrify the, yeah. the legacy fleet. Um, but there's sort of, you know, onesie twosies here and sure. there. They're looking at different cases. Yeah. Well, and I think there's, uh, not to change the subject, but I think there are people looking at electrifying, quote-unquote, like muscle cars, right? So take an old Mustang or Camaro and figure out a way to put a drivetrain from a Tesla or something in it. All right, Ivan Betts, are these vehicles capable of auto rotation? And I think it might be worth sort of describing auto rotation. And I, again, but, right, both of us aren't helicopter pilots, but as I understand it, your engine engines quit, and now instead of you propelling your blades with uh, engine power, you let the air propel your blades, and you convert that at the end to hopefully make a soft landing, and probably helicopter pilots right now are throwing things at the radios and, and computers. But fixed wing guys trying to explain auto rotation. Yeah. It might not go very well for us. But, no. But, uh, I, but I guess the point is I, I don't see an electric motor having the same either problem or – Capability if it does have a problem, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, we're not really seeing that as far as in design. If you looked at some of these these designs, I mean, they have some large wings. So in some of the failure modes that you look at, it's actually a fairly decent glide ratio they're looking at. So it's not necessarily 
uh, using auto rotation as like their their backup fail safe if you have failures. But hey, this becomes a uh, fixed wing glider based on how the some of the designs are at. So I think that's probably a little more likely the scenario if you mm-hmm. have that significant number of, of failures as opposed to an auto rotation type thing. So I, I haven't seen anything specific of people designing for that okay. uh, capability. Getting back to the military thing, you said something that reminded me of like when they would uh, put self sealing components in fuel tanks. At some point, if these aircraft are going to be in harm's way, they might need some protection, which, of course, can add weight, too. But is that being discussed, or are we just trying to get the technology figured out first, and then we'll cross that bridge later? Yeah, I think right now the big focus on uh, commercial side and with the battery tech is how do you make sure we keep these things safe? So it's a lot of high-power batteries sure. that are in there. So the focus is on that right now as right. opposed to ballistic protection there. But there's still a, you know, a crash protection piece to this. Of, hey, if we have a lot of these things on, on board, you still need to make sure if we have it, incidents that they're just safe and there's not a, a large danger with that amount of, of batteries on there. So that's where the focus is right now. That's where we're seeing a lot of the uh, the tech investment of taking what is from um, a you know, electric car has a certain safety factor that it needs to be into, all right, now we're going to put these in aviation perspective. Let's make sure we are developing them safe so that we have all this energy storage on there uh, that protects the people that are on board. So there's a lot of work going into that on mm. multiple fronts. Gotcha. I think we answered Tom Oates' question, does it really need to be manned? What is the new concept of a pilot in these vehicles? Anything more to add on that? <laughs> I, I think the only thing I'd add is maybe touching on Whitman's point earlier, too, is, you know, if we eventually, when we eventually get to a point where these are optionally manned or, or remotely piloted, you know, that unlocks a, a whole new dimension of, of trade-off decisions at the at the mission planning level, you know. Do we need to ruggedize it or what, what level of survivability does it need to have or mm-hmm. is saving the weight? And there probably are weight savings to be had. You know, is that worth it in in our theater of operation? Uh, can we achieve the commander's intent uh, through you know multiple attritable vehicles rather than having to make that you know really challenging decision about putting a human in harm's way? Yeah. So I think you know future state this unlocks a, a whole different way of thinking around doctrine and employing these different assets, especially if we're talking kind of like we were earlier. You know, we're not going out to replace anything, but rather supplement and provide you know another option in a, in a commander's toolkit for how to really achieve, you know, uh, effectivity in, in a theater. And so I, I think that the the concept, even being able to take something, you know, maybe like the Aaliyah that has an opportunity for a pilot to get in there and go out and execute maybe a more advanced mission or a very specific mission, uh, also being able to take him or her out of the cockpit and now have a totally different calculus of, of risk uh, will be really interesting and really powerful. All right. And the last question is more of an observation from Scott Kelly. I've worked in aerospace electronics, says Scott, and major cost drivers are the software and programmable device quality assurance requirements, which require huge amounts of testing and validation, requiring large amounts of time and resources to perform. I have to think this is not only true in general, but true when you're pioneering a whole new uh, space, if you will. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you have, we have, there are many different design concepts out there. That some of the companies have taken different approaches, but I mean, in general, that, I mean, the comment is completely valid and applies just to this uh, new part of aerospace as well. Okay, yeah. that software assurance and making sure that those things are are set uh, and, and safe is a critical piece of the development of these platforms. Just the same. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we've been talking all this time about the future of all this, but what is the future as far as you can see it from where you all sit? I mean, more of the same. Uh, we talked about iterating. We talked about the new designs and testing. But what do you see coming down the pike? I mean, especially in this in this area, it's uh, how do these companies progress to get out to the market? And that'll be really critical to get some of those initial operations uh, out the door. That's what we're trying to help facilitate. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's something we haven't touched on that applies to both many areas of emerging tech, but certainly in a new area of, uh, of aviation, is the public trust piece. So these look different. They're going to be operating differently. Uh, I will say a huge benefit of them that you just have to see to understand is a significantly decreased uh, noise level based on how they have their propeller setups. That's, a, that's something that I think people will really uh, enjoy. But people have to see it because right now, um, they are out there flying. They're in the company places. They're out some of the, the test ranges. People need to see to gain that kind of support. Be like, yes, I want to go buy a ticket. I want to go put myself in, in that. Yeah. You'll, you'll have your, so just like anything, you'll have your early adopters. Right. Uh, but getting that, that trust built up to get the you know, the masses to say, yep, I want to use that as a, mo- a mode of transportation. I trust it. Uh, it's safe. Uh, that's going to take some time. We want to help promote that by doing some of these initial operations with the DOD to help kind of gain that support and, and trust with the FAA and 
and just as importantly, the public mm -hmm. for eventual long-term commercial success. And I would think that bend in the bell curve, if you will, whether it be acceptance, but more importantly, sales, is probably significant to this whole discussion, right? Because as soon as we get that acceptance and get some made, of course, as we start building them, we realize what is more easily reproducible. Maybe that's not the right word, but mass producible, uh, but also what people like and don't like. I mean, there's got to be, I would think, that hey, this is the bend in the curve now. More and more people are getting these things, so it's sort of validating what we're doing. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Cool. Where can people learn more about AFWorks, Agility Prime, all these different things? You'd sent me some links, but uh, where, where can folks find online? Yeah, well, the first one's easy, AFWorks.com. A-F-W-E-R-X.com. You got right. it. So we, we keep our stuff on what we're, what we're doing, some you know, some basics on all of the programs that we talked about today, mm -hmm. uh, Agility Prime being one, uh, future programs that are coming down the pipeline as well. So sure. that, if you want easy information, go there, one-stop shop, and it can link you to a lot of different things. Sure. Uh, we're out there talking uh, to spread the word, both on just getting small businesses engaged as well as just kind of providing education on what we're doing, why we're doing it. Uh, which is just as important. Yeah. And that's just the AFWorks part. Then, of course, there's the companies, right? Joby and Agility, not Agility, that's you all, uh, Beta, uh, et cetera. So there's there's all of those. And there, are those probably like startups, sort of uh, like venture capital type so, places? Or? So some have been startups, <laughs> but you've seen some of them um, grow pretty significantly. So if you look at some of them, they've raised a significant amount of money, whether uh -huh. that's going through SPACs uh, over the last couple of years or just for, for Private investment. You've seen some go from a you know a very small startup all the way up to you know a thousand plus people. No longer a small startup anymore, yeah. but a really significant uh, company. It takes a lot of money to do that. They've raised a lot, uh, and now they need to you know really get to that point where hey, let's get this to market yeah. and, and prove that out. So yeah, there are certainly lots mm -hmm. of lots of companies out there in the, some of the startup phase, but there are, are some that are also starting to grow out. Uh, and what you also see is some of the you know major major vendors also backing some of them. So um, while not all of them have gone off and done, done their own vehicle, but for example, Boeing, uh, you know, mm -hmm. backer of, of, of Whisk for, is, is okay. just one example there. Okay. So that some of them are involved in, in that respect uh, to provide that initial support as the, as the initial market matures. Cool. Stewie, we're about done. What did I not ask or what do you want to make sure our listeners and viewers understand about AFWorks and Agility Prime and all these companies really working their way through this third revolution of aviation, right? I think you covered it well. Um, hopefully your listeners got what they came for. Your watchers uh, got got the same as well. Um, I, I just encourage anybody who's interested in learning more. You know, we're, we're on social media as well. Um, some of the key words that maybe might be worth Googling, urban air mobility, advanced air mobility, um, and, and Tom mentioned it briefly. Um, you know, some of these companies have, have really grown and, and built out really impressive capabilities. Several are, are publicly listed. And so what comes with that, obviously, is a, quite a bit more reporting and information that's available in the public domain. So um, there's some great information out there, uh, some great partnerships you know, with commercial uh, airlines. United, for example, just announced a partnership with Archer Aviation. Um, so there's a, a bevy of information out there. Um, throw it in the Google machine and uh, and just sort of follow the rabbit hole. Okay. And when you said social media, do you mean specifically for Agility Prime? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the usual places, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, or, uh, LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so okay. AFWorks has a presence on Twitter, LinkedIn. We follow us there. Check out what we have going on. Well, before you all go, you know the little tradition here we have at the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So uh, Stewie, right? Bo yep. uh, Griffith. How did someone come up with Stewie? Yeah, well, I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I sort of went through a transition out of the cockpit into the engineering and maintenance field. Um, when I was going through that, I hadn't been through the call sign review board yet, which of all the naval traditions is easily my favorite. Um, but people needed something to call me for some reason. Uh, Bo wasn't just cutting it. And, uh, you know, my last name is Griffith, not Griffin, but uh, f few people, if any, realize that. So Stewie just kind of caught on. I was working with my friend Gail at the time, and she was like, I'm not calling you Bo. It's going to be Stewie. Uh, just randomly? Out of the air? Yeah, well, I think Family Guy reference, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, it's a good example of how, you know, maybe the best idea isn't the one that makes it across the finish line. Sometimes it's the first idea. Because I, I tell you, when it was getting a call sign review board time at my fleet squadron, uh, I was trying to turn all the knobs to get away from Stewie because I, I didn't love it. You know, I was, well, that just solidified the that it. it in like a burn. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're, you're thinking I was playing checkers. I was playing chess. You know, I was, ah. I was saying how much I love Family Guy, but you know, maybe casually revealing embarrassing pictures of me in college. You know, previous nicknames and saying, God, I would hate to be called troll. Uh, and it came down to the time, you know, and, and it, it just stuck. So, <laughs> All right. Well, 
it'll probably be with you uh, as long as you're around and hanging out with folks like uh, Wickman over here. So I yeah. uh, hope you're used to it by now. And a wind-corrected munitions dispenser is not, I don't think, a CBU-99 that I used to drop. I think it's its own separate thing, right? It, it is, yeah. So um, a lot of the details are sort of won't go here. But, yes, wind-corrected <laughs> munitions dispenser, CBU-103s, 105s, 107s, okay. some of which we don't use anymore in the inventory. But it was something that we trained on in B-52 and— uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to guess. Am I allowed to guess? I'm going to guess like you dropped a whole bunch and the gunners didn't wire it right and they all dudded <laughs> or you dropped them on the wrong target. But, but I'm just I will say no comment to the above. But <laughs> <laughs> all right. We, we don't get to know about it. Not right. on that piece. Though. All right. Well, you're, you're in you're in <laughs> Good story uh, behind. you're in a small group of company. We had a Cosmo that didn't want to tell how he got his call sign. I don't know if it had to do with the magazine or not, but at any rate, that's all right. Well, when you first sent it, because we've been corresponding via email, you said, oh, yeah, it's me, Stewie, and WCMD. I'm like, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> but, uh, it's not easy. It doesn't roll off the tongue. No. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, guys. Well, you've been good sports. Thanks for coming uh, all the way here to San Diego to talk about AFWorks and Agility Prime and these cool aircraft that are really revolutionizing aviation. So it was a great, uh, great opportunity having you both here. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it.